All right, I think we're I think we're about to go about to settle in. So um good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to this week's edition of Paleo Perks. Um, my name is Elizabeth Seibert, and I'm one of the committee members who helps make this possible. And it is my pleasure today to host Sun Chen He from the University of Leeds in the UK, where he'll be giving a talk titled Marine Redox Dynamics Across the End Triassic Mass Extinction. Um, so for those of you who haven't been to a Paleo Park seminar before, um, basically this is a um, talk that'll, or that we'll, we'll start with a just brief welcome and announcement that's happening right now. It'll last somewhere between two and five minutes. Then um, Chan Chen will give his talk and it'll be followed by a moderated Q&A, which will be about 10 to 20 minutes. Following the formal portion of the talk, we have a, an informal tea time with our speaker, and that is a great chance to stick around, chat about any number of things, it's just a chance to continue the conversation in a less formal setting. And then finally, um, we actually take your questions via the chat. So um, throughout the talk, if you have questions, please send them to the questions at Paleo Perks host, who is Chrissy today. And you can see that in the participants. All right, so just a wee little bit of housekeeping. Um, first thing is that Paleo Perks values the participation of all folks interested in the paleo sciences. So we ask that you please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. If you have somehow found yourself in this room without having first seen and signed our code of conduct, please just hop over to our website and check out the code of conduct, knowing that being here today means that you are agreeing to abide by it. Um, you should not be able to unmute yourself. However, if you find yourself unmuted, please mute yourself and remain muted for the duration of the talk. And as we mentioned, you can ask questions by chatting to the questions at Paleo Perks host. Or at the end of the talk, you can use the raise hand function and we'll let you unmute yourself to ask the question verbally. Um, any technical issues should also go to the questions at Paleo Perks host. Um, some other little housekeeping things is that we actually have closed captions built into Zoom now, so you can use the CC button on your Zoom tools to either show or hide them as you choose. And then finally, we always ask and are looking for outstanding early career researchers to join our potential speaker pool. So if you've got any, any paleo friends doing anything from paleo climate to paleontology to paleoanthropology or anything in between, um, please nominate them to join our potential speaker pool. Um, and then finally, we also have a um, demographic feedback form that tells us who's coming to these seminars and gives you an opportunity to give us a little feedback so we can continue to improve them for the community. The survey is completely anonymous and optional, but we encourage you to fill it out so we can continue to do better with this with this series as it goes. All right, so I think that's all of the things. You can find links to all of those things in the chat right now. Um, but let's actually go back to our amazing speaker. So today's speaker is Dr. Chan Chen He, and Chen Chen actually has um, quite a diverse background in terms of coming from China and having done his bachelor's in geology at the East China University of Technology followed by a master's in geochemistry from Nanjing University. He then moved to the UK and did his PhD in geochemistry at the University of College London, and is currently a research fellow at the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, so at this point, I am done talking and would love to hear from Chan Chen about N-triasic redox conditions. Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, <laughs> hello, my name is He Tian Chen. I'm a sedimentary uh, geochemist uh, from University of Leeds. And uh, uh, thank you for having me here to, to join and share and uh, discuss my research with the Paleoprax uh, fans. And today I'll be introducing uh, some of my uh, recent progress uh, on, the, on risk constructing the redox dynamics in the ocean across the Antarctic uh, mass extinction event. So the Antarctic mass extinction uh, was one of the uh, big five mass extinction at about uh, 200 million years ago. It happened both in the uh, marine and terrestrial ecosystem, uh, but in the ocean, it shows a, a major loss uh, in, for example, the uh, Triassic ammonoids, uh, bivalves, and, and especially conodons. Uh, the extinction is uh, thought to be synchronous with a significant short-lived 
uh, climbing extreme with hyperthermal uh, conditions uh, lasting uh, uh, for a short lived, like at least 50,000 years. And these events has also been suggested to be uh, linked with the uh, uh, broadly synchronous emplacement of these uh, uh, Central Atlantic magmatic uh, provinces, uh, so LIP. So the associated extensive uh, volcanism and greenhouse gas emission around this time would have likely uh, induced a rapid warming uh, on a global scale during that time. Uh, and as we know, it, there are many uh, environmental effects or, uh, or consequences of hyperthermal events. Uh, for example, in the in the case of uh, anthropology uh, warming events, and there's, there are lots of biochemical extremes, which includes uh, ocean uh, heating, uh, uh, ocean acidifications, and marine deoxygenation, and other related biochemical feedbacks. And in particular, the 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 ocean oxygen deficiency uh, in the, for example, coastal seas and expansion of oxygen minimal zone on the mid-depth uh, water uh, would have placed a significant impact on the marine uh, aerobic uh, organism and the ecosystem. And the, the, the anthracic mass extinction we study here uh, was also very short-lived climate event with one of the uh, fattest uh, warming rates and the highest temperature rise thresholds in the Phenozoic extinction events. So the understanding of this late Triassic environmental uh, crisis, uh, such as redox states of the ocean, can potentially inform the consequences of the, the present day uh, global one. And compared to other uh, Phenozoic examples, it was also among the, the most severe environment crisis that associated with the development of climate extremes, uh, climate effects, and widespread ocean uh, deoxygenation. And in terms of the marine redox uh, work uh, across this event, and it, it is actually one of the uh, most uh, understudied among the big five. Uh, many of the previous study uh, constraints are largely based on, uh, for example, indirect redox proxies such as uh, sedimentary features by fascist indicators or, and we have some, some breakthrough uh, with the uh, advances with the biomarker constraint. And, and but some other uh, research did not, did not uh, really uh, fu fully discuss the redox changes in the context of fossil records. And we do not have a global scale understanding uh, of the water column redox condition and across the, the different uh, uh, water depths. So we try to contribute to this subject uh, with, uh, with three site projects uh, focusing on, on the redox condition from the shallow uh, to, to, to deep ocean in both Texas and the uh, Pensalasa Ocean, and from the shallow to mid depths uh, water across this event. And the first study was to use the uh, sulfide to composition of uh, seawater sulfate to track this uh, marine anoxia. And here we utilize this uh, sulfur cycle systematics uh, to explore a possible redox perturbation. So the sulfur isotopes of seawater sulfate is actually dynamically controlled by variation in the fluxes and isotopic uh, composition of the riverine sulfate sources and the marine pyrite barrier. The, the one of the, the removal pathway uh, uh, from, uh, of ocean sulfate from the ocean through the gypsum deposition, it does not generate any uh, significant isotopic fractionate fractionation. But this sulfur sink pathway makes the global seawater uh, sulfate reservoir smaller and could also result in the ocean sulfate uh, pool more isotopically topically, uh, susceptible uh, to other fluxes changes such as uh, pyrite weathering and pyrite barrier. And here, this uh, production and the barrier of pyrite represents a, a primary uh, redox sensitive pathway, uh, which drives a, a large isotopic offset between the uh, seawater sulfate and sedimentary pyrite through this uh, bacterial sulfate reduction under anoxic conditions. And this offset and the, the size of the sulfate reservoir really control this variation uh, in the sulfur isotope composition ocean of sulfate. And the evaluation of these fluxes, a rate of uh, 
uh, pyrite barrier in sediments, uh, which favors anoxic conditions, can inform uh, the marine redox spiration uh, through time. Uh, and here we use this uh, classic carbonate associated sulfate, the CAS uh, uh, proxy, uh, in bulk marine carbonate and biogenic calcet to reconstruct the primary seawater sulfate uh, sulfide to composition. And here I use the uh, miniaturized uh, cast extraction method and follow the strict uh, cleaning protocol, including uh, bleach uh, and several sodium chloride washes to remove all, all the non cast uh, sulfur contaminants and to isolate, extract the, the, the structurally substitute the sulfate bases that should represent a seawater sulfate signals. And here's the data. Uh, we found a uh, positive uh, sulfide excursion in dissolved sulfate, uh, which coincides uh, precisely uh, with the, the onset of the antrust in max extinction horizon at all studied sections in both the Texas and the Pensilaza ocean. And there are two uh, consecutive excursion uh, shown at the Sicily uh, section with the first one uh, in the latest rating, uh, we think it can be correlated with the ones found at the other two sections. So these preserve uh, excursion magnitude uh, for above 10 per mil. Uh, and besides the, uh, the, the Delta Sulfur 34 uh, uh, baseline uh, at the Pansalasa uh, Black Bear Ridge sections are more positive uh, than the Texas one. So we, we think this could be uh, likely due to the development of sulfate isotopic and the concentration hydrogenity uh, between the, the two oceans uh, under low sulfate uh, condition. And our age model uh, calculates the event was short-lived uh, as uh, about 50,000 years. And this enormous uh, sulfide excursion event, we, we, we expand that could be, have been driven by an increase in the net barrier of sedimentary pyrite under expanded uh, anoxic or euxenic condition uh, with possibly a larger area of uh, uh, the oxygen minimum zone. And these uh, changes could have enriched uh, the oceanic uh, sulfate pool with heavier uh, sulfur 34 isotope. But we think this, this anoxia was slightly res restricted uh, in the mid-depth uh, water of the continental shelves and slopes. And because we know from the previous studies in Japan that the deep ocean, the plagic uh, deep ocean remain oxygenated. And also based on these uh, coincidence uh, between the extinction and the development of the marine anoxia, we confirm that the, the marine oxygen depletion was uh, one of the major environmental stressors uh, during this extinction event. And so because of this the rate of uh, uh, seawater sulfate that has offered 34 change, it's a response to, uh, uh, to changes in the power barrier and weathering fluxes, and also depends on the sulfate uh, uh, concentration. Uh, so, and the lower sulfate concentration can permit uh, a faster uh, shift uh, in the uh, sulfate, sulfate isotope variation. So we, we, we used this uh, sulfur cycle mass balance model, which suggests an extremely low uh, initial uh, sulfate uh, conditions to require to, to permit a large magnitude of uh, uh, positive excursion within the 50,000 years the time frame. So this model also confirms uh, roughly a five-fold increase in the power barrel rates uh, due to an, uh, marine anoxia expansion, and, and the o, which can also readily uh, replicate self isolated excursion. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we either lower, lowering the pyrite weathering or increasing the fractionation factor between the sulfate and pyrite, they cannot reproduce this uh, excursion event. So in terms of the low sulfate, the driving mechanism for sulfate, uh, low sulfate condition, we think the vaporite deposition is one of the, uh, the key driver for this. And as shown in this uh, Warren's uh, the global halide deposition mass uh, compilation, there's actually a significant uh, 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 the increase in possible evaporite deposit from the middle to, uh, to the late Triassic. And this is also supported by a lot of geologic evidence that these late Triassic evaporites were widespread 
in the Rift basins as Pangaea uh, began to uh, break up during this time. So this enhanced developer uh, deposition is a very likely mechanism which can uh, precondition the ocean uh, with the low sulfate condition uh, before the hyperthermal event uh, kick in. And this kind of positive sulfide discussion event is not alone uh, in the Phenozoic. It's not unique. There are many uh, other similar uh, events in the Mesozoic uh, to Paleogene time. Uh, uh, and they are usually also associated with the moving anoxia uh, and different degree of uh, extinction rates and also, also the rapid warming events uh, possibly due to a uh, large igneous province in placement. Uh, so to explain this coupling uh, behaviors between all these uh, feedbacks or effects, environment effects, we propose a conceptual model to link the uh, low sulfate condition with the marine anoxia. Uh, we know that in the marine uh, sediment, the sulfate and organic carbon availability really control the redox gradients and the balance between the sulfate reduction, mesonogenesis, and anaerobic uh, oxidation of mesin, which use sulfate. So under this high sulfate condition, so for example, the modern ocean, the more organic carbon uh, uh, can be utilized by the sulfate in the sulfate reduction zone. Uh, mesin generated below can be mostly oxidized by sulfate uh, at the sulfate mesin transition. So in this case, only very few basic mesin can escape from the seafloor, which uh, does not consume a lot of bottom water oxygen. But instead, on, under the low sulfate condition, the proportion of the, uh, the organic carbon available for the mesin production is increased. Uh, but the sulfate driven, uh, uh, this anaerobic oxidation of mesin is kind of suppressed. So in this, in this case, the mesin production uh, moves closer to the uh, sediment water surface and the mesin, uh, 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 basic mesin flux following this red arrow is increased. So which uh, produced the high demand for the, the bottom uh, auction, uh, 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 bottom water auction. So another important feature in this, uh, this model is that the low sulfate condition are established uh, due to evaporite deposition. Uh, uh, so, so we think it's, uh, it's come before the volcanism and a warming start to, to, to play. So the low sulfate condition we think is really uh, uh, like a prerequisite which makes the marine anoxia more expanded as a result of increased seafloor mesin flux and uh, oxygen demand. So this could explain why the, the anoxic condition is more severe on the low sulfate ocean and why not all the hyperthermal events uh, uh, can have a widespread OEE. So from this study, we found the sulfide of evidence suggesting a widespread development of anoxia and also with low, uh, 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 broadly low sulfate condition in the ocean uh, in the mid-depth water, uh, possibly at a global scale, but at least in the northern hemisphere. Uh, but however, at these all our three study sections, they're all shallow marine carbon section. Uh, for example, at this uh, peritidal setting of uh, uh, Mount Sparago sections, we found in situ the basic fernal extinction, the magnodont. And we still cannot explain why the environmental forcing drove this biotic turnover at regional scale. And we know it was certainly not anoxic. So then we introduced the, uh, the carbon associated iodine uh, proxy to track where there is the in situ hypoxia event. So, so less severe than anoxia uh, at this section during the extinction. So in short, uh, because the, the, the IO date, uh, uh, the reduction potential is close to that of the oxygen in the water. So the iodine specialization change is more sensitive uh, to even smaller degree of oxygen decline in the seawater. So more precisely to constrain uh, oxic to, to, to hypoxic uh, uh, condition with dissolved oxygen content uh, between uh, 10 to 100 micromolar per kilo. And this R date, uh, the, 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 the at fully uh, uh, oxic condition were completely reduced to the form of iodide at low oxygen condition. And also because the shallow marine is the carbonate can only substitute our date. So when the water column uh, oxygen levels uh, drops, we expect to see a drop in the uh, measured iodine concentration in marine carbonate. 
And indeed, uh, the data measured at the uh, this peritidal section show a sharp drop in the iodine concentration, which may indicate the depletion of the dissolved iodate pool uh, due to this decreased oxygen. Uh, uh, and it uh, could be in situ in the shallow ocean, so it can expand the local extinction of large fancy animals. Uh, but besides, the, uh, uh, the this iodine decline was actually synchronous with the sulfur ice to excursion event, and as we already discussed before. So these concurrent excursions suggest extensive anoxia in the mid depths of water of the continental shelf and slope at the time. So here we propose that the anoxic conditions likely expanded uh, from the mid depths uh, oxygen minimum zone uh, into the shallower uh, waters during the extinction event, uh, causing hypoxia and iodate uh, uh, depletion in the surface waters. Uh, we also look into this more restricted uh, European epicontinental sea basins, which are located uh, in the western uh, Texas during this uh, late Triassic. So these uh, uh, semi-enclosed the marginal sea basin are also very important uh, uh, for, for, for the study of late Triassic marine redox, redox structure, uh, which includes the famous the St. Norges Bay uh, sections and the Leostock section uh, of, of the uh, uh, Bristol Channel Basin from the southwest England and the land section uh, from the Northern Ireland. So this is because that the, uh, the, the current understanding and the constraint uh, of these extinction events are, are, are very uh, largely based on this fossil record and chemostructivity stratigraphy in these cyclic successions. And also besides, just in this dominantly uh, mudstone and black shale post section, we also recently uh, discovered a two-phase uh, extinction pattern uh, for basic microfauna uh, across the TJ bound boundary. Uh, 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 so these sections uh, are perfect candidates for directly correlating the marine redox uh, with their paired uh, fossil record. So here we apply this uh, classic Ion specialization proxy, uh, which calculates the reactive abundances of highly reactive ion phases that tend to form and precipitate in uh, sediments on the anoxic uh, water column. So these ions will mobilize from the shelf and will transport it from the uh, to the basin, deep basin, and it can be reduced and precipitated as pyrite uh, in a euxinic water column where you have uh, a lot of free, free hydrogen sulfide. Or precipitates as uh, non sulfidized ion minerals such as iron carbonate or iron oxide or oxides uh, on the anoxic fruginous condition where you have a lot of available, available iron but no free hydrogen sulfur. And the, the highly rated ion uh, includes uh, the carbon associated ion, pyrites, uh, the various oxide or oxides, different mineral phases plus the magnetite. And the threshold have been made uh, based on this calibration. On data from both modern analogs such as uh, the Black Seas and Asian marine silicosis sediments that deposited on the uh, different redox condition. And to be simple, that the uh, the relative enrichment of polyrefined to total iron ratio here, if they, they are above uh, 0.022 to 0.038, uh, uh, they're always regarded as anoxia, but if they're below 0.022, they're regarded as oxy condition. Then we further uh, distinguish the anoxic condition by using the, the, the amount of pyrite that can be deposited in euxinic environment relatively to the uh, highly uh, uh, the total highly radiofine uh, phases to identify between the ferruginous and euxinic conditions uh, with the threshold at uh, 0.6 to 0.8. So these kind of overlapped uh, uh, zones between the thresholds are considered as the uh, equivocal, it can be both uh, uh, conditions. So here are the data, and at these first St. Orgeous Bay sections of the Bristol Channel Basin, uh, our data of highly redefined to total iron ratio throughout the late Triassic and early Jurassic, I show values mostly above the threshold for uh, 0.03a here that regarded uh, as uh, anoxic uh, conditions. We then introduce another independent proxy, the uranium to aluminium ratio, to compare with the ion proxy 
uh, because uranium is also very sensitive uh, to anoxic condition and it can be easily reduced and become less soluble and enriched in sediment relatively to the upper continental uh, crust. It is also because the reduction of uranium also starts uh, at the, the, the iron 2, 2 3 redox boundary and uh, links directly with the iron redox reaction uh, rather than uh, in the eugenic uh, uh, environment. So the, the co-enrichment or the co-variation uh, between the two proxies should demonstrate a, a progressive enrichment of both uranium hydrated iron as the, uh, the anoxic intensity or persistency uh, increased. So, and the two proxy at these uh, data at the St. Orgers Bay section demonstrate uh, uh, a positive correlation with uranium hydrated iron co enrichment, uh, which confirms the anoxic, uh, dominantly anoxic water column condition throughout the section. We also further distinguish the anoxic condition uh, using the, the pyrite to hydrate iron ratio which near all data falls into this equivocal zone between ferruginous and euxinic. So to determine whether they are ferruginous or euxinic, we used another uh, uh, redox sensitive trace metal, the, the, the moly, which is more uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, reactive and can easily scavenge in sediments on the more euxinic condition. So the, so the molybdenum uh, concentration and the moly to uranium data of the late Jurassic actually show relatively lower values when compared to the overlying uh, Jurassic zone, which suggests that the, the not euxinic, uh, uh, very severe euxinic, there should be uh, dominantly uh, ferruginous conditions in absence of uh, free hydrogen sulfide, uh, apart from a few very short-lived uh, uh, euxinic episodes. And uh, by contrast, the, uh, the water column became more euxinic across the TG boundary as uh, through the earliest the Jurassic, as evidenced by the co-enrichment pyrite uh, molybdenum. So this initiation of the uh, intensified euxinic condition coincides with the second phase of the extinction event, uh, possibly suggesting that this toxic euxenia was a major environment stressor uh, in these basins. Uh, so there's one thing I need to clarify, uh, because although these two chemistry data at face value, they indicate extensive anoxia throughout but we do know, do know that in these redox, uh, this redox condition will not permanently or persistently develop because they are frequent occurrences of epipernal and infernal microprocessors, bivalves, brachypole, and lots of biturbation throughout. Uh, and these basic organisms, they're traced uh, very sensitive to in situ oxygenation event. But it should be uh, noted that these biological records only provide information on, on more like a transient or instant oxygenation events. And our two chemical proxy here uh, actually document a time in integrated, like an average redox signal that corresponding to an interval that's covered by each sample. So these anoxic interval are not uh, permanently. So they may have fluctuated between anoxic and oxic conditions on a variety of time scale. So to characterize the, this distinction between transient and persistent, persistent redox states, we introduce the terminology uh, commonly uh, here to emphasize the dominant uh, redox condition uh, at the time. So we also examine the Leo stock section from the same uh, Bristol Channel Basin, which show exactly the same redox involution pattern as we see in the, the, uh, the St. Orgers Bay, but very differently uh, in this uh, sh shallower uh, land basin. So the early Jurassic uh, part was still dominant by an oxyfrugian condition and with uh, intensified euxinic condition at the second uh, phase of extinction. But the but very different to the deeper Bristol Channel Basin, the oxic condition uh, seemed to be to have uh, uh, dominated dominantly the basin during the late Triassic and across the first phase of the extinction, as suggested by low uh, hydrated and total iron ratio and uranium concentration. So we propose the dynamic redox uh, evolution pattern across the TG boundary in this uh, continental sea basin and confirm that the major extinction phase was uh, associated with extreme euxenia. Uh, uh, so very likely a killing mechanism. We also identify 
a uh, spatial redox variability in the late Triassic between the Bristol Channel Basin and the Land Basin, with the land uh, developing more oxygenated condition, uh, likely due to its relatively shallower uh, uh, water depths. So, so in summary, we applied a multi uh, geochemistry proxy to reconstruct uh, a full redox landscape across these uh, TJ transition in different geographic uh, localities and water depths, which we found the global scale to confirm a strong link between the, the major phase extinction and ocean deoxygenation. Uh, but we do know that the uh, the contemporary plastic deep ocean in Japan, some marginal sea base in Europe, uh, the, the, the remain well oxygenated across the initial phase of extinction. So this deoxygenation uh, possibly has limited geographic spread and may have varied in time. And so I think future work should focus on other localities, especially in the, uh, the southern uh, hemisphere for redox study. And beside the pre and post extinction European uh, continental sea basin show a highly fluctuated redox state between anoxic and oxic condition over uh, unknown uh, variety of time scale. And in the future work, we should resolve this by looking to the, a high resolution redox analysis, for example, at uh, Obito time scale. And we should also look into other uh, redox related or redox driven uh, by, ge by geochemical feedbacks, such as the uh, mesen cycling or and the uh, basic uh, nutrient cycling, which has a major impact on the uh, marine productivity. Uh, and, and finally, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, all the support from my fundings and projects, especially my colleagues at least, and all the international partners that uh, participated in this study. And that's all from me. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for that really for that really interesting talk. I feel like I see a lot of of things on sulfur isotopes and iron and it's just really interesting to see how they can all come together to tell the story of ocean anoxia or not as you as you will um so i'd just like to remind the audience that you can ask questions for chen chen but by sending them via chat to the questions at paleo perch host who is chrissy um and if you have a question you'd like to ask verbally you can use that little raise hand function in zoom and we'll go with that we do have a couple of questions to get us going. And um, one of the questions here is, are there any other dramatic climat climate transitions which are similar to the Triassic-Jurassic transition? And are the trends that we see at those transitions the same or different? And I assume in the sulfur and, oxy or sulfur and iron. Uh, sulfur and iron, yeah. So, uh, so there's a one a very close example would be the Elitoasian event. You also have the positive soft ice excursion event, uh, the slightly uh, lower warming rate, but uh, very similar envir environmental effects. We have uh, we also have the the the, the expanded anoxia, which which drive the uh, which drove these uh, soft ice to sulfur cycle perturbation. Also, uh, the similar uh, response in the the iron cycling. So with also with the uh, uh, expanded fluorogenous uh, condition or eugenic condition, many basins uh, in the Europe in the Western Texas. So and also I think the because the late Triassic this event uh, has a very high uh, very uh, very high uh, warming rates and also very high uh, temperature rise threshold. So it's is 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 in some way uh, quite similar to our uh, uh, modern day uh, warming. So, so we could possibly we can't use this as an Asian analog, but it can inform some of the possible environment effects that could result from the current warming trend. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next question I have is an anonymous question. It says the expansion of oxygen minimum zones in the modern ocean is often associated with increased productivity in the surface ocean. Do you have a sense of surface ocean productivity during the Triassic Jurassic event? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the uh, because it's a hyperthermal condition, not uh, the, the eutrophication and uh, the elevated marine productivity on Tuesday, and and this uh, organic carbon uh, loading to sediment will be enhanced. That's for sure. So these could be one of the uh, the reason to drive this uh, uh, the expansion of uh, anoxia, especially the deoxygenation of the surface ocean. And so 
so we think there's a, but of course there there are several other uh, 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 possibility like uh, a missing uh, basic missing uh, production which uh, which uh, uh, worsened this uh, deoxygenation from the bottom water, and the, on the other on the other hand, the methane production, benzene methane production, can be enhanced uh, by more organic carbon uh, loading. So so the reactivity can be enhanced. So the so so the deoxygenation will be uh, uh, will be uh, more severe uh, than the non hyperthermal events. Excellent. All right, so then this next question asks, how does diagenesis affect your sulfur isotope? Oh, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. we do a very uh, thorough uh, uh, diagenesis evaluation. We read that paper. And uh, of course, we use some uh, uh, lithological uh, screening, uh, checking, and also uh, use the, uh, uh, a lot of geochemical indicators, such as the, the magnet to strontium ratios, and also evaluate the, the dolomitization and how they uh, impact the self isotope uh, data, but which, which we do not find any correlation between them. So, so, we, so we, are, we, we are kind of uh, half confident that, <laughs> that uh, they should represent a, a, a seawater sulfate uh, uh, signals. But if you, if you ask me whether there's a diagenetic imprint, so I can't be 100% sure. So the, the, the diagenesis could alter some of the self isotope, isotope to a minimal uh, change. But consider this, uh, this large magnitude excursion events, we do not think the diagenesis is the major uh, control uh, on our data. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so the next question I have um, is, can the different forms of iron give insights into nutrient distribution in the water column? Sorry, uh, the different oh. phases. Different, yeah, different phases of iron give insights mm -hmm. into nutrient distributions. Ah, uh, of course, yeah. So, so the so different uh, uh, redox uh, conditions will have an impact on the, for example, the basic uh, uh, nutrient cycle, especially phosphorus. So, so for example, in the uh, in the more eugenic condition, I expect that the more uh, reactive phosphor will be uh, released uh, from the sediment to the to the water column, which would enhance the uh, marine productivity. But I haven't done any uh, phosphorization study. Uh, in the future, I will be it will be a, a really good uh, uh, subject to to look at. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So we actually have two questions that are kind of coming in from, from different directions. I'll read the one that came to everyone in the chat first. Uh, this one says, very cool research. For the first topic research, have you looked or are interested in looking at lipid biomarkers of methanotrophy, particularly linked to anaerobic methane oxidation? There are some diagenetic products of, this, of these molecular fossils that might be a potential biomarker if carbon-13 is depleted. Yeah, I, I didn't look into this, but... Uh... I, I, I totally agree that the, the biomarkers and the uh, a lot of our biomarkers are really uh, like as uh, a uh, very uh, robust uh, indicators. And I think my colleagues uh, in the Southampton, the, the Professor uh, Jessica White and the Callum Fox, their group have done a lot of uh, similar works, which uh, which their their funding are quite consistent with our uh, inorganic uh, with the uh, uh, geochemical proxy, which uh, suggests that a similar uh, redox uh, pattern uh, with uh, intensify anoxia across the TJ boundary. Thank you. All right, great. So this question is from Wei Mushu, who asks, um, what do you think causes the very long recovery of the sulfur isotope record for the TORC in Hawaii? Huh. <laughs> so, uh, so we're actually working on this project. and. Uh, I can give you a heads up that uh, we, we now think it could be due to the shutdown of the vaporite uh, uh, deposition. So, so which means a, a shutdown of the low sulfate condition, uh, which uh, kind of uh, it's reached a, a kind of a balance and, and sustained this uh, sulfide uh, conversation at the, the same high levels and did not go back. So that's quite unique with the situation, but we have to test this hypothesis uh, with other events but there are not too many uh, similar 
uh, uh, cases uh, in other Mesozoic examples. So yeah, I hope this is satisfying. We can talk, talk about that later, <laughs> personally. Awesome. All right. So I have just like a couple of questions left in our queue. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, please make sure it gets into the question queue very soon. Um, um, but the next question in here is about the frequency of fluctuations between oxic and anoxic conditions. And do you think that could have impacted the intensity of extinction observed? Um, yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so do you uh, have, I think I'm going oh, to follow sorry. up on that and say, you talk about maybe doing high resolution records, but do you have a sense of sort of how in, how intense those fluctuations were and frequency they were? Yeah, so uh, there's a two distinct uh, 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 scenario uh, in, in, in our uh, uh, European Epicontinental Sea based in the records. So during this uh, major extinction, uh, major phase of extinction, then we have extensive uh, anoxia, or we can say more persistent uh, uh, anoxia. So, so in this case, we have a less fluctuated or, 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 or a less frequent oxy condition, but with more frequent uh, anoxy conditions. But in this recover phase of the earliest the Jurassic, uh, we, we still see this kind of at face value, this persistent uh, uh, high rate of enrichment and the uranium enrichment. But we do find the uh, uh, Bansic fossil was suggesting there's a higher frequency of oxygenation event or transient oxygenation event. So I think the, 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 the one way to resolve this is really we need to correlate uh, with the, uh, the geochemistry data, with the, uh, the, the, the fossil record uh, to precisely constrain the persistency of these, uh, uh, these redox condition. But in future, for sure, we'll have to do the high resolution uh, uh, measurements of the sediments using geochemical data. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so this uh, this will be our last question. It's a little bit of a bigger one. It says, do you think that anthropogenically induced dramatic climate change could cause similar reactions in our oceans today? Yeah, I think so. So, so in terms of deoxygenation, I think we're still already seeing that uh, a dramatic oxygen decline in many coastal uh, uh, seas, uh, and also expansion of oxygen minimums, on which will have a, a huge impact on the. Uh, uh, for example, the fish stock, the economically and also environmentally. So, I, but the driving mechanism could be uh, could be different. Uh, so, the current, uh, so the, the, it's not uh, due to a, a lip eruption, but, but due to the human human being uh, activities. But we we can actually use these uh, Asian analogs to to kind of a warning or or or, or kind of predict. Uh, uh, how would this uh, anthropology and uh, warming will, will go? So thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chen Chen, for such a fun talk and for the discussion afterwards. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and finish us out and thank everyone for joining us this week. Um, so thank you again for, for the talk and for the audience for joining us. And we'd like to ask you if you can to fill out our weekly feedback form, which we will link in the chat so we can learn a bit more about who attended today's seminar and if there's things we can do to improve. And we'd like to invite you all back next week on July 5th at 1500 UTC. So that's this time um, when Melissa Kemp of the University of Texas at Austin will be giving a talk entitled Extinction, Colonization and Conservation in a Biodiversity Hotspot, Lessons from the Caribbean Fossil Record. So something completely different. Um, but up next, uh, if you have not gotten enough of ocean anoxia eugenia and um, want to talk more about that, um, Chen Chen has agreed to stick around for a little while for a tea time. And um, our question of the week this week is, which mass extinction would you most like to have observed in person? Um, so for those of you who'd like to stick around for tea time, we're going to set this little two minute timer so you can get up, walk around. If you're like dying to get out, now's a good time to leave the Zoom, but we'll see you all back in about two minutes. <laughs>